But thank you all for coming, and thanks to Anna for writing this book, which is a groundbreaking book, because I went to the bookstore before this event, and there are rows and rows of books about parenting, and some of them are nice, and some of them are scolding, but I didn't see anything about grandparenting. And I thought, you've invented a whole new genre. Oh, I, I don't oh. know if that's even dimly true. Really? But, but I think probably if I've invented anything, it's confessional grandparenting. <laughs> Anybody who reads this book knows, as my children like to say about my mothering, mistakes were made. <laughs> That's very Watergate of them, right? Um, uh, but, but so much of what is parenting literature is finger-shaking, and people with camera phones who are out there telling you how you're doing everything wrong. But as you point out in the book, parenting is protein, grandparenting is dessert. Wow. You know, all life should be dessert. Yeah, well, exactly. And, you know, when you don't have grandparents, grandchildren, people who do are always saying to you, it's the best. It's the best. And there's this little part of your brain that thinks, ah, oh, come on, you know, I had kids. I've done this. I've played with Legos. I've hated playing with Legos. <laughs> you know, and then it happens to you and you think, wow. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a shame there's no way that you can just like skip to dessert when you go to a restaurant, but you can't just skip to grandparenting dessert. Well, I, the one thing that, that has bothered me about a lot of the conversations about being a grandmother is that they assume that being a mother is kind of the stations of the cross, as, as they say in my church. And um, I actually really loved being a mother, as I think most of America knows, having read me, um, and, and had the best time with my kids. The thing that is so powerful about having grandchildren is uh, no matter how good you are at it, no matter how well-wrapped you are, the parent-child relationship carries with it ego freight. How your kids turn out, whether they're walking at an early age, whether they're reading at an early age, which college they go to, which sport they play, in some way that, that most people don't want to acknowledge reflects on them. Oh, this means I did it right. Oh, this means I didn't do it quite right. Oh, I feel like a failure. Oh, I feel like a success. You know, it's like that old vaudeville joke, you know, enough about me, what about you, what do you think about me? Um, and, and parenting has that kind of Feedback ego, loop. that kind of ego involvement. I don't feel any of that with grandparenting. I didn't care when Arthur got out of diapers. I didn't care when Arthur started to talk. I, I don't care about any of that. I can actually live in the him of him and the Ivy of Ivy, who's now almost a year old, without feeling that kind of emotional rebound of how does this make me feel about myself. And, but also grandparenting, as you point out, is a pretty modern thing because in the past, people didn't live a long, long enough to really be grandparents. Well, the, the fact is there are more, grandparent, more people with grandchildren in America today than at any time in our history um, because hmm. of longer life expectancy. Um, and, and so it changes. And I, I hate the word parenting. As I, yeah. as I discovered, the word parenting is like a 1970s invention. I mean, in a, my mother had five children. She never said she was parenting. <laughs> Sometimes she said she was pulling her hair out, but she never said she was parenting. Um, but, but the way in which we engage with our kids um, in, in this last generation is materially different than the way our parents did. Um, part of it is because our parents could afford to be laissez-faire. I mean, my mother could afford during the summer to watch me ride off on my bike at nine o'clock in the morning and not see me again until dinner time. That seems like quite a different world. Why, is it seriously different or do we just perceive it because we, we buy into this danger, danger, Will Robinson mode? I think there's some of the second, but a lot of the first. Um, 
you know, one of the things that someone, uh, a social scientist said to me, which is really true, is when I was riding that bicycle in, say, 1959 or 50, uh, 1960 in the suburbs of Philadelphia, there were many, many, many fewer cars on the road. Mm. And those cars that were on the road were different kinds of cars. They weren't SUVs. So, so that simple consumer shift tells us something about how children have to have to live every day and so I, I think that obviously we've all heard the term helicopter parenting but even if we like to think we're not being those helicopter parents I mean my kids would come home and say to me you know mr. so-and-so doesn't like me well if I'd come home and said to my parents Sister Mary Luke doesn't like me. They'd be like, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> or good for her. <laughs> um, whereas, whereas we got into a position where we started to take those things more seriously, yeah. if not intercede. I was lucky. My kids were non-interventionist kids. That is, they would look at me and say, do not do anything. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is we're doing more and grandparents are doing more. When I was on book tour with this book, I met so many people who said, well, we live here in San Francisco, but um, our grandchildren are in Denver, so we bought a little condo in Denver, and we go there one week a month. And I thought, you know, I, I mean, I had a very close relationship with my grandparents, and in the way of these things 60 years ago, all of their grandchildren lived quite close to them, but in a million years, my grandfather would not have pulled up sticks and <laughs> bought a little place to be closer to his grandchildren. So again, it's, it's different in terms of that engagement. It's also different in terms of grandparents who are providing childcare, because since both parents are working in so many families, um, often grandparents are are filling in as caregivers. I hope that's not your grandchild calling, whoever it is, if you will. <laughs> I'll turn off your phones there. Uh, maybe we can agree to throw out parenting and adulting into the, yeah, the those, word trash can. Th those both have to get. What did we throw out yesterday? We were doing a panel on women. What we threw out feisty, um, feisty. Op opinionated, right. and bossy. Right. Those, those are the three, three words that are only use used about. for women who are behaving as women ought not to behave. And I'm eliminating all of them. And there are always more. <laughs> always more coming up. So, um, when you talk about being the mayor of Nanaville, I am the mayor of Nanaville. Nanaville is the little town you inhabit. Talk about Nanaville. You have it's a population of two, right? Well, well now, three, it's now, now it's a population, it's a population of, of three, three and a half. But oh, really? Oh yeah, I've got way? one due in June. Well, it's too soon to vote yet, so still, <laughs> still legally too. But so, what are the rules of Nanaville? The, the, rules, the town charter of Nanaville. The, the rules of Nanaville are that you don't talk about Nanaville. It's like <laughs> Fight Club. Like no. Fight Club. No, uh, the rules of Nanaville are um, uh, you can ask Nana to do things that Mama and Daddy say no to, and Nana will say no to them too because she wants to stay on Mama and Daddy's good side. <laughs> Very important rule of Nanaville. Um, Nana can be on the floor as much as you want her to. As much as she's able to get up from. Nana will read to you as long as you want her to read to you. And we, the same book over and over. Well, no, we've, got a, we've got a rotation of a number of them at this point. One of the most single most thrilling things to me about being a grandmother, because of what I do and my relationship with my own children is, a lot of the books that I read, well, that we all read to Arthur, are books that belong to Quinn, Chris, and Maria when they were growing up. And boy, you can see it. You know, our copy of In the Night Kitchen looks like the night kitchen spilled all <laughs> over it. Um, but, but to have, I mean, that sense of continuity, that sense of, I once read this to your daddy and now I'm reading it to you, that's so powerful. And while you talk about grandparenting as dessert, you still don't think that whole conspiracy of grandparent and grandchild, don't tell mom, but, is a bad idea. 
Well, I don't think it's a bad idea, but I think you have to be respectful of the kids' parents and, and not try to undercut them in any way. So if I'm going to do something that I think is kind of to the left of what Quinn and Lynn would normally do, most of the time I ask them. You know, I'll mm -hmm. text Lynn, um, Arthur says, can we stop at haagen -Dazs? when I'm taking him home from preschool, and I'm supposed to be taking him home and feeding him dinner, and obviously a haagen stop is A, not gonna count as dinner, and B, going to materially affect dinner. <laughs> and you know, occasionally she will say, not today, you know, this has been an issue or that has been an issue, but most of the time they just say, you know, let it rip. And, and there's a separate toy cupboard at Nana's house um, with Arthur's stuff in it, and he knows you know, to go in it and take things out. And he knows to put things away because that's mama's rule that you can't, you can't move on to the next thing until you've put your toys away. And a very good rule, I a think A very good rule. We can all observe it. Yep. <laughs> uh, one thing you pointed out, which hadn't occurred to me until you pointed it out, was because parents are with their children every day, they may not see the changes incrementally that you see with a gap of even two or three days or a week. How does that function in terms of your relationship with the kids and maybe what you tell the parents about what you're seeing, good or bad? Well, first of all, one of the rules is if, if you're taking care of the kid, let's say this recently happened, Quinn, uh, Lynn, and Arthur went away for the weekend and I just had Ivy. Mm -hmm. And Ivy has, um, she is the fastest marine crawler I've ever seen. She's flat on, but man, the upper body strength is really impressive. But she hasn't started to do crawling, crawling on the knees. And if she had started to do that while they were gone, I would not have told them that. Oh, no, so because they didn't want they, to miss it. No, they should see it for the first. If it's going to happen for the first time, if somebody's going to take their first steps or sleep through the night for the first time, it has to happen on their watch. And if it happens on my watch, I have to pretend it didn't happen on my watch. I think that's... Sound I, advice, everyone. I, I, think that's, I think that's only fair. So um, that, that's one of the things that, you know, look, I, you know, I was a mom, and, and I remember how vulnerable you feel. And anything you can do to make the parents of the kid you love, parents that you love as well, feel more large and in charge is nothing but a good thing. And it all bounces back to you. Because the more you give that out, the more likely they're gonna be to hand the kids over to you. But, but I, I see that particularly with Ivy now. I mean, Quinn came in the other day and I said to him, just in two days, the babbling is off the charts now. And it's hmm. so conversational. You know, the thing where she looks at me and goes, Anna, Anna, Anna. Huh? And I go. Inflections and everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, both of these children are, are bilingual in Mandarin and English. So sometimes when she babbles, I think, is she babbling or is that Mandarin? <laughs> 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 I do not know the answer. <laughs> do you get the sense that as kids test boundaries and limits all the time, that you're being tested? Oh, yeah. In some examples to oh, see well, what they can get away with, with you that maybe doesn't wash at home? Uh, th there's kind of a covert game that Arthur plays, which is, how dumb is Nana? <laughs> um, so, so the other day... This goes back to what I was just saying about bilingual. Arthur said to me, it smells like ma poop in here. And I said, what's ma poop? You know, he's in that stage where, like, poop is, it's poop so is hilarious. Um, you know, and I said, what's ma poop? And he goes, ma poop. And, and I go, what is, and we go back and forth. Now, I did, as I say in the book, take Mandarin lessons for about a year. Um, it was one of the most painful experiences of my life and really showed the limits of my intellectual capabilities. But I retain a very few things. I mean, I know how to say, whoa, well, I need, which means I love you. And I know how to say ni hao, which I say every afternoon to the Chinese nanny when I come in with Arthur from preschool. And suddenly I said, ma, horse. And he said, 
yes, Nana, Ma is hoarse. And it was like, <laughs> how long does it take Nana to get the picture? <laughs> but I think, you know, there's something great about being a little kid. All human relations are about power and control. All of them. And the people who tend to feel like they have least power and control, least agency, are children. I mean, I think it gets to a fever pitch when they're teenagers, when they feel like they're given responsibility and no power and control, which is, in my memory, hugely frustrating. But when you're, when you're little and you feel this limited sense of power and control, to have someone who you can feel superior to is invaluable. And, and it's not going to be mama and daddy because feeling superior to mama and daddy is too threatening, even, even when you get to be a teenager, although you try to pretend you're superior all the time. And, um, and so I, I think pranking Nana makes Arthur feel like, ha, ha, I got a leg up here. <laughs> <laughs> because you're a writer and you live in a world of words, here you are de dealing with this little being before he even has words. What is it like to see the world through his experience when he doesn't even have a way of describing it yet? Uh, first of all, on a purely selfish level, having young children and now having gr young grandchildren made me an infinitely better writer. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, what you realize, and I realize it all the time when I'm with the kids, is... The imagination, the way of seeing the world as a series of unfolding mysteries is in full flower when you're a small child. And what happens as we get older is that it gets dulled. Over and over again, it gets dulled. And the trick, if there is any trick, to being a, a resident writer is to take away that dullness, to see the world anew, to notice the details. And kids make you do that because they notice the details. So I, as I mentioned in the book, there was one day when Arthur and I were walking down this long driveway out at the house in Pennsylvania, and he noticed his shadow. And we spent probably a half an hour trying to run away from the shadow, trying to step on the shadow. Then I did shadow hands, you know, the rabbit and all that and everything. And I thought, the last time I noticed my shadow was probably 30 years ago when I noticed it with my daughter Maria, my youngest. And things like that, coming back to things like that for somebody who is trying to be a prose stylist, is just invaluable. And trying to help them hold on to that. Um, so, I mean, part of it may be because of what I do for a living, but part of it might just be the human condition. I spend a lot of time in what I think of as simile and metaphor conversations. So Arthur will notice something and I say, oh, what does that remind you of? And then he finds things that it reminds him of. And, you know, it is like, it is as. Um, and, and we do a lot of that kind of conversing as much for my sake, I think, as for his sake. When I was reading about that and preparing for this, I had remembered a story and went back to find it about a study from Ohio State that parents who read five books a day, whose kids or the grandkids read five books a day, hear five books a day, get into kindergarten hearing about one and a half million more words than kids who are never read to, and it is this million word gap that only gets wider and explains yeah. differences in achievement academically, in success, in life. It is a phenomenal statistic, and I had to read it over a couple of times. You know, kids who even get one book a day hear a third of a million more words by the age of five than those who don't regularly get read to. Yeah, I mean, reading to little kids is just uh, invaluable. And, you know, you start it when, you know, they're, th I mean, I read to Ivy and then she wants to throw the book across the room and chew the corners of the book. And, and I remember that Arthur did the same thing. And now Arthur can't get enough. You know, at night, it's it's one more book. And, and I'm discovering all these new books that I didn't know before. And um, 
we talk including about everybody poops now is that one of his them. favorites you know he's not he's not so much into that he's much more he he kind of likes silliness um we have one that just came into the rotation called dragon was terrible that's kind of hilarious and another one where this elephant breaks his trunk um about this elephant and his friend who's a pig um all of them seem to be anthropomorphic but that's absolutely fine with me and um and and we just read over and over and over again did your kids know you were writing this book Oh, well, that was the, the only way I would have written okay. this book. When I was doing a column for the New York Times called Life in the 30s, when the boys were um, a toddler and a baby and then two toddlers, um, obviously I couldn't ask them. Um, so um, their dad sort of backstopped everything, but I, he never had to bring down the hammer because I was so keenly aware of thinking what will it feel like to read this at age 16. Uh, with this, it was easier. Um, my agent, who is also a grandmother, was at the house in Pennsylvania when Arthur was an infant and was there with his parents. And she said to me, when they went over to put him down for a nap, I can get a contract for this book in an hour. <laughs> and I said, what book? And she said, oh, come on. I mean, really, this has your name written all over it. And I immediately said, no, no, you know, I, I had custody of the stories when they were little, um, but now they have custody of their own stories. And Quinn and Lynn came back over, and I said, you know, Bink, my agent's name is Binky, um, Bink thinks I should do a, a grandmother book, but I told her no because you know, this is your story. And both of them said, we'd be fine with that um, as long as you let us look at the manuscript and see if there was anything that was bothersome. And there were one or two little tweaks they wanted to make, but nothing substantive. And, you know, when I, when I did the, column, the Life in the 30s columns, I was very nervous about the kids growing up and thinking, that I'd made my bones off of their backs when they were too young to consult, con, to consult about it. And somebody said to me, listen, when your kids grow up, they will have this book and it will tell them what you thought about things when they were small. And that's a mystery to most people and it will be an incredible gift to them. And it made me see the entire thing differently. And sure enough, when Quinn and Lynn were reading the manuscript, both of them kept saying to me, oh, I forgot about this. Uh. Oh, I forgot about that. And it made me really happy that it was a kind of a repository of some of the stories from Arthur's early life that they would have forever. Because the book, in a way, is as much about them as it is Absolutely. about the grandchildren. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot about both of them and what terrific parents they are. And this I, is... I'm sorry. Again, I'm not... I, I can't I can't parse this out, but I'm not sure I would have felt as free to write this book if they weren't both such exemplary parents and if I didn't have such a good relationship with my daughter-in-law because you gotta keep you gotta keep that one you gotta keep that one on the straight and narrow. Yeah, I, I hear yeah. knowing laugh I see, out I in the see audience that I'm here. getting a response from that, and it's and and it's true, and and you write in the book about this. You know, if, because you've been a parent, you think you know, or at least a lot of parents think they know the answers when the grandchildren come along. And you write about a, a woman, a grandmother, who wrote a three-page, a daughter who wrote a three-page parenting memo to her own mother about how to take care of the grandchild. Yeah. Three single-space pages. Yep, yep. And the mother was, was very offended. But I remember uh, I had Arthur when he was 10 months old, when Quinn and Lynn went away for the weekend. And Quinn gave me an Excel spreadsheet of his schedule. <laughs> and I still have that Excel spreadsheet. And every once in a while, I'm like, oh, Quinn, here's the Excel spreadsheet. And he goes, OK, never mind. We don't need to have By the way, when they left Ivy with me, there was no Excel spreadsheet because she's a second child. <laughs> um, but there is a power dynamic. And you talk about hanging back. and sort of waiting for permission, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, that you can do what you want to do with the grandchild. Well, I do think 
it seems like people who have read the book, particularly grandmothers, the big takeaway has been one anecdote in the book, which is that when Arthur was about 18 months old, um, Quinn and Lynn informed me that they intended to start him in this preschool program. And I thought that he was too young for that. Um, you know, and it, when I was raising my kids, there was this kind of daycare situation, which has morphed into kind of more of a preschool thing. And there's many more of their contemporaries who do that. So I, I said, I said, oh, you know, he's so young. I mean, you know, if if you wanted to get an, a new nanny, I you know I I would help pay for that. And they said, no, no, we're we're going to do this preschool thing. And I said, well, maybe just a couple of of mornings a week. And they said, no, no, we're we're going to do this preschool thing. And I can't remember what the final straw was, but my son, with whom I have a, a fantastic relationship and and a very respectful one, when the rubber meets the road, finally, basically said to me. We got this, you know. It was like it was like I'm done. And the next morning, I was power walking with my friend Susan, who actually taught both of my sons in sixth grade. Um, and um, and I am telling her this whole story so that Susan, of course, will say, "Oh my God, I can't believe they're doing that. You're absolutely right. You're a genius," you know. And and. We get to the end of the story, and there's a long pause, and then Susan says, did they ask you? And that was my guiding light from there on out. Did they ask you? And if they didn't ask you, then don't volunteer it. Because if they want to know your opinion, they will ask you. And if they don't want to know your opinion and you inject yourself, you are in danger of, if not estrangement, at least a certain level of distance. And that's really hard for me because, let's face it, I raised three really lovely adults. I think I'm really good at this. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, um, it, it really turned out to be a good, piece of, of, a good piece of advice. And they do ask me a lot. Um, but I, I don't, that was the last time that I pushed in that particular kind of way. It doesn't sound like you've ever encountered what some people have, which is the baby is the bargaining chip. That, no. You know, withholding for, well, if you'll pay for his college, you can keep him on the weekends. Woo! <laughs> um, um, I, I, I have offered to pay for many things. <laughs> um, but I think, I think that kind of transactional thing is, is unpleasant. I mean, I mean... I would assume that they want, because they're two good, smart people, I would assume that they want Arthur and Ivy to spend a lot of time with me because having as many people in the world who love you and think you hung the moon is always a good thing. And I want to be with them for the same reason, but also because I know from long experience that raising kids is hard and it's exhausting. And if somebody can give you a little bit of a break every now and then in small ways and even larger ones, it's nothing but a good thing. It's a long way until these are uh, teenagers, your right. grandchildren. But you're laying the groundwork of a relationship where they can maybe confide in you at that age and ask you questions at that age. They might not be comfortable asking their parents. Well, it, it's funny. Um, I live in a really big brownstone house now, and I've been thinking about, you know, maybe moving to an apartment. And, and I said to Quinn at one point, you know, I'd really need a three-bedroom apartment. And he said, well, I understand you want a guest room, but what's... I said, well, you know, on those times when Arthur and Ivy say to you, we're running away from home. <laughs> and, and, and they walk... I did that just last week. And they walk out onto West End Avenue. They can tromp over to Nana's apartment and say, Nana... Uh, for some reason, I thought I was going to be Nana, but Arthur goes, Nana, Nana, N Nana, can I stay here tonight? And the answer will always be yes. I, I think you sort of, I think it's good to have a safe harbor um, outside of, of your actual house. And I hope they always see uh, my house, wherever it is, as that safe harbor. I was struck by a figure you cited in the book that one out of seven children born in this country is multi-ethnic, multi-racial. And some of the questions that you have to deal with 
are mind-boggling that people would even think it's okay to ask questions like this. Well, we keep thinking about it because um, my son Christopher and his wife Azara are expecting a baby in June, and Azara is biracial. And we know from experience that this baby may either look a fair amount like Chris, who had a big head of blonde curls when he was a baby and is quite fair-skinned, or a fair amount like Azara's mother, who is quite dark. And so they'll, they'll become this question of, you know, is that really your baby? Um, I mean, Azara's mother tells these very painful stories about people, about pushing her children around in the stroller and people thinking she was a nanny. Or the kidnapper. Because they're, they're sort of cafe au, au lait colored. Um, but, but it's just as telling with a child who is part of what in this country is sometimes considered a model minority. So a very sophisticated, educated woman in New York said to me of Arthur, at least you'll never have to worry about how he does in math. And I was like, really? Is that carried on the Chinese DNA, this math thing, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, and then there was a guy who, when I was in Baby Gap, said to me, where did you get him? And that's when I, and I said, Whole Foods. <laughs> because I just couldn't believe With it. With free delivery. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> of course, we live in such a topsy-turvy world now that the, in the book I say I was in... Um, this gourmet food store on the west side of Manhattan, and I had Arthur in the in the Bjorn when he was really small. I think he was maybe two months old or something. I was standing there buying fish, and this woman's standing next to me, and she looks at me, and she goes, you look good. <laughs> and I go, what? And she goes, you know, he's really young. You look good. And I go, I'm his grandmother. <laughs> and then I thought, in Manhattan, in the year of our Lord, 2018, I guess somebody could have shot me up full of hormones <laughs> and you know, done some crazy science experiment on me and this could be my baby. But, but I, I didn't know whether to feel flattered that she thought that maybe this was my child or just think, we have all lost our minds. <laughs> um, when I grew up, all of my grandparents and we were the surviving set of my great-grandparents we were in a five-mile radius. Uh -huh. But Arthur's grandparents live in China. Well, That's Arthur's something. grandfather, Lao Ya is the term for maternal grandfather. Lao Ya um, lives in Beijing, yes. Um, and, but I live 25 blocks um, oh, south from, of Arthur, two yes. two stops on the um, so, on the express train. So, is, do you know them at all, except through Arthur and through your son and daughter-in-law? Do you have a relationship, and do you I, see I, how their grandparenting? Style actually, I works? just saw I just saw Shang Li, who's here from Beijing and is supposed to go back tomorrow. But who knows whether airplanes will still be yeah, flying to China yeah. tomorrow? Um, and and he's been here for the last two weeks. And one of the things that that you know, there's a lot of negative things that we can say about new technology, but boy, there's a lot of positive things too. Most mornings, Arthur starts a day with Lauya on the iPad, and Arthur and Mommy and Ivy all sit in front of the iPad and talk to uh -huh. Lauya in Beijing. Because of the time difference, it, it works out perfectly. So that when Lauya walked through the door last weekend, Arthur jumped into his arms because he sees him most and mornings. not a stranger. So that's so that's one of those invaluable tools of technology. What a lovely story. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, I think we are going to take some questions. What I will need you to do, though, is to stand up and shout it out because I have to repeat it so we get it recorded. So, all right, here's somebody first. Stand up, please. Yes, you. Okay. Um, how did you get the name Nana? Okay. All right. The question is, how did you get the name Nana? Because usually it's not up to you to decide what that is. Well, I was asked while um, Lynn was pregnant what I wanted to be called. And I have always assumed that I would be called Nana because my name is Anna. 
and it's an anagram. Um, and, and I love anagrams and palindromes. <laughs> Arthur and I have talked a lot about palindromes. Abel was I, uh, I saw Elba. And my first name. <laughs> um, there That's you go. That's right, it is. There you go. So, um, but one of the interesting things when I was on book tour with the book was people telling me, gee, I wanted to be called X, but my grandchildren called me. Mimi seems to be really popular. Gigi seems to be really popular. But one woman told me that her first grandchild, her granddaughter, called her Graham Cracker. <laughs> and now she has eight grandchildren and they all call her Graham Cracker. <laughs> so so there's a lot of picking, there's a lot of picking and choosing among the grandchildren and also making the distinction between daddy's parents and mommy's parents in terms of not wanting to be confused about the names. So there, there's a lot of picking and choosing in a way. I mean, when I was growing up, my grandparents were grandma and grandpa. You know, it was as simple as that. And, and that's no longer the case. And then, as I mentioned in the book, there are a fair number of people I've, I've encountered who want to be called, like, let's say, Barbara, because grandma makes them feel old. And I'm like, okay, you are lucky enough to get to be a grandmother and you want to be called Barbara? Be still my heart. We're never going to be friends. The, those of you who watch Downton Abbey may see how aggrieved Lord Grantham is that his grandchildren call him Donk, which is short for donkey. So you get the idea here. Yeah, stand up, please. I need you to stand up so I can hear. I'll repeat the question, don't worry. Um, how do you handle that? I mean, All right. like my, do, my grandchild comes over and I give him a baggie of goldfish crackers. And then sometimes my daughter-in-law would say he can only have three, which only makes him feel bad. Crave them. Okay. Yeah. Let, the, the question is, what do you do when your daughter-in-law is dead wrong? The example is the child comes over, gets a bag of goldfish crackers, and the daughter-in-law says, no, he only gets three. And that does make him feel bad. And then, so. he, uh -huh. hides and and then he hides and gorges on what he can get. You keep your mouth shut. <laughs> because and the you, baggie, too? Because the more you say something, the more she's going to feel your disapproval. And the more she feels your disapproval, the less likely she's going to be to let her child hang out with you. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I've heard too many sad stories um, since I published this book about people who get to see their grandchildren twice a year on holidays, very carefully supervised. And some of it is just because of a clash of personalities, but some of it is because the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law or even the daughter and son felt so much second guessing and disapproval emanating from the grandparents that they just felt that it was better to absent themselves. And, okay. and I we, feel we like- go back and forth. It, no. you, I think in every human relationship, you have to ask yourself, what is goal one? What do I want? And as a grandparent, I think goal one is time with grandchildren. Okay, another question right here. Hey, that was my grandfather. He loved it. You know, I, I've come to love it. And, uh, but uh, with five children, uh, I, I raised as a single dad. Uh, I've got nine grandchildren scattered around the country. So um, obviously they're not close by. And I think there's probably more of that, I think, than ever. Yep. And so it makes me feel guilty sometimes when uh, I, I don't feel like I'm reaching out to them well enough. Recommend that grandparents you know, make that. Uh, in other words, the kids aren't going to call me all the time. Right, right. So I, I'd like to hear any comments you might have okay. about um, maintaining a long distance right. relationship with your grandchildren. The long distance relationship with your grandchildren, when in this case nine scattered across the country. You you're, don't have you're really that. lucky, nine, man. I mean, it, one of the interesting things is how the, the numbers have changed. So as I say in the book, my grandparents had 32 grandchildren. 
they're Irish Catholic. Uh, they had 32 grandchildren. My father had 12 grandchildren. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed that I'll wind up with six, two for each of my kids. Um, so there is that funnel effect. But I do think FaceTime um, on the computer or on the iPad can be a really great tool. And the other thing is sometimes people don't have that close a relationship with their grandchildren who are far flung when they're really young. But when those grandchildren get to be 13, 14, 15, they can come and stay with you for two weeks during the summer and you can develop a completely different kind of relationship. Um, or you can plan trips with a couple of them together, particularly if the cousins are close or if you want the cousins to be close, which I think is a great relationship in smaller families. I mean, my, so Arthur said to me the other day, I said, I said, Azara's taking a nap because you know she and Shushu, paternal, paternal brother, uncle in Mandarin, she and Shushu are going to have a baby. And he, and he said, I know, it's a boy. And I said, I know. And, he, and I said, it's your cousin. And he said, it's my brother. And I said, no, it's your cousin. And he said, daddy said it's my brother. And I said, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I said to Quinn, uh, Chris and Azar's baby is Arthur's brother, and Quinn said, I might have said that. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to roll with it. <laughs> but I do think those cousin relationships, particularly we have more and more families with only one child, with only children, and if they have cousins, it provides that kind of sibling backstop um, that, that at least as the oldest of five, I've come to count on. Yeah. Uh, back here, yes, right there. No, no, I'm sorry, it was here first, please. <laughs> was, then you're next. Sit down and I'll get back to you, thank you. I was recently asked to lead a discussion among friends and friends of friends on what makes a good grandparent. So I went to my children and I asked them, and my daughter said, three babies. But my son-in-law said, which I thought was beautiful, engaging with them as the people they are. So I'm curious what... Repeat. Okay. What's let me repeat this. It's um, um, the, the question of the most important thing I think I can sum up that a grandparent can do in terms of was it babysitting or is it relating to them as the people that they are? And we'll look, get through this quickly so we get to the last question there. So, well, I think that is what the difference between the ego involvement you have with your own children and the way you can see your grandchildren clear without feeling like there are any kind of a reflection on yourself except for a reflection of love. I mean, I, I'm really able to see Arthur and Ivy as their own selves. Um, although Ivy is turning out to be very strong-willed, um, and both Lynn and I have discussed the fact that it's really hard to disapprove of that when you see it in the little girl because you understand that the world is going to disapprove so much of it that you just want to sort of keep it going. And the last question, can you stand up, please? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have for being a grandparent to teenagers? Uh, well, she's not there yet, but thank you. The advice for being a grandparent to teenagers, you can try out all your ideas here. No, but I also think it goes to being a grandparent at any stage of your grandchildren's lives, and that is meet them where they are. So, you know, right now, I am so invested in dinosaurs. Now, I have been invested in dinosaurs in the past, 30-some um, years ago, but Arthur's brought it all back around, and so i got to keep track of Styracosaurus. And it's not and, a brontosaurus anymore. And now, oh, and now they're all, there's all these new dinosaurs. And, 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 but with teenagers, I think you need to meet them where they are and also keep an open mind and an open ear because sometimes they'll feel because they sense that ego involvement that parents have by the time they get to be teenagers. They know if I tell mom or dad this, they're gonna feel, it's going to make them feel bad. But sometimes they see their grandparents as the opportunity to vent that they aren't necessarily comfortable um, doing with their parents. And so I think you have to... It, I think it's also always helpful to keep the face that doesn't show shock. <laughs> no matter what you hear, no matter what you hear, there's kind of this half smile and tilt that you can bring to the table, even though you're thinking, 
oh my God. It's the psychiatrist <laughs> killed, isn't it? Yeah. So, anyway, Anna Quinlan will be signing her book. In the meantime, would you please thank her?